The night unfurled its inky cloak, and the forest whispered dread as I ventured deep within, a chilling welcome to the abyss. In our first story, someone dials Boothworld Industries and gets a real person, Samantha. The operator schedules remodeling and asks for payment in the form of a daughter, leading to a horrifying twist. And the second a childhood box fort leads to eerie events. Dog disappears, strange tunnel inside. Reality distorts. Chasing the inexplicable, fear takes hold. Listen carefully and tell me if you feel scared. I'm just hanging around you, expecting you to give that video a thumbs up and leave a comment pronto. Time to get this bash started. Like many of you, I dialed that number for Boothworld Industries. Before I made the call, I went through the responses in the thread. I like knowing what's gonna go down before it does. I suppose I'm kinda dull like that. Still, it gave me a rush to punch in that number and hit the call button, even though I had the whole scoop. I was on the landline and made sure to block my deets just to be on the safe side. But then something went screwy. You guys all got a voicemail, but I got a real live person. Welcome to Booth World Industries. I'm Samantha, and I'm the operator today. Name? I was stuck at this point. I didn't know what to say. I was expecting some pre-recorded message, like the rest of you got, maybe even that weird text. I never saw a real person come in. I freaked out and hung up the phone. Five seconds later, when it rang again, I hightailed it out of the house to scoop up my daughter, Ariana, from school. On the way back, my cell started buzzing. Ariana's all about that hands-free phone in our car. She likes to grab it and pretend she's in a spaceship, talking to a Cylon or something. I blame my husband's constant Battlestar Galactica watching for that. Mummy? Ariana asked, can I hit the button? Sure, I said, just do it quick before the light changes. Ariana unbuckled her seatbelt and reached between the front seats to tap the button that'd answer the call. Hello, she said after waiting for the beep that told you the phone had picked up. I heard the same voice from before, cold, almost robotic. Welcome to Boothworld Industries. I'm Samantha, and I'm the operator today. Name? Everything stopped for me right then. The light turned green, cars zoomed by, and the ones behind me laid on the horn. But I sat there, staring at my steering wheel. Slash or slash no sleep is supposed to be the spot for spooky tales, a place where you can give yourself a little fright, but come out okay in the end, a place where you live out your fears. That lady's voice on the other end of that phone ain't safe at all. Mommy. Ariana asked, Is everything all right? Hello, Ariana, the operator said. Welcome to Boothworld Industries. I'm Samantha, and I'm the operator today. Name? I didn't say nothing. I hung up the phone and drove the rest of the way home. Ariana looked up at me as we walked up the driveway. Was that a Cylon? I put on a smile even though it felt like someone had stabbed my gut, and it was still twisting in there. Nah, sweetheart, I said. Cylons ain't real. My little girl gazed at me, her brow all wrinkled, and she frowned. That broke my heart. It was the first time I'd lied to her. Nah, it wasn't a Cylon on the other end of that line, but there was something missing in that Boothworld operator's voice. Something shattered. Something human. Something dead. When we got inside, I fixed Ariana a cereal bowl and took it to her room. I turned on SpongeBob SquarePants for her to watch, and I knew what needed to be done. I entered the Boothworld Industries number into my cell. As I held the phone to my ear, there was someone breathing on the other end. I didn't even hear it ring. Hello? I inquired. 
Welcome to Booth World Industries. I'm Samantha, your operator today. Name? My mouth went dry. I was aware of my duty. Janice Hoffman, I replied. Janice was my boss at work. Though her voice brought to mind Fran Drescher, her wandering hands reminded me more of that shady boss from Disclosure. On the line, I could hear Samantha vigorously tapping away on the keyboard. It seemed like she was wearing one of those wireless headsets and pounding her face into the keys. Janice Hoffman, she confirmed. Remodeling is set for January 14, 2022. Would you like to reschedule? Yes, I agreed. We've got an opening on Monday. That's fine. Would you prefer a courtesy call? I'd wanted no part in listening to someone's demonis. No, I declared. Are you sure, Mrs. Jacobs? Yes. All right. On Monday, the 13th, we've got Janice Hoffman scheduled for remodeling. Fine. Mrs. Jacobs? Yes. How do you want to handle payment for this? What the heck was she talking about? The original story never mentioned anything about payment. Payment? I questioned. Yes, Mrs. Jacobs. When you schedule a remodeling, the scheduling is final unless another member shifts the scheduled date. We expect payment in full before service is rendered. What's the cost? Ariana. The name lingered in the air. Ariana. I murmured. What do you mean? The price for the scheduled remodeling is your daughter, Ariana. If you don't pay, we'll have no choice but to repossess what's due. My blood turned to ice when she mentioned repossessing. I could sense her grin on the other end of the line. It was the first hint of emotion she'd shown so far. What's the difference between payment and repossession? I asked, closing my eyes. You can earn back some of the payment, at least parts of it, by referring new members. Unfortunately, all repossessions are final. Why are you doing this? Ma'am, you responded to our ad and called us. You contracted work on Janice Hoffman. Now we're at the payment stage. The cost of the work is your daughter, Ariana. You can't take her. Fantastic. Repossession is scheduled then. We at Booth World Industries appreciate it and welcome you to the club. Have a great day. I flinched when the phone made that clicking sound. I moved it away from my ear and just stared at it. If I hadn't felt like I was going to cry and throw up at the same time, I might have cracked up. Everything was insane. That was nuts. I stared at my cell screen. The Booth World Industries number was still right there on the display. I dashed into Ariana's room. It was empty. Her cereal bowl sat on the towel I always put under her stuff in case she made a mess. In the bowl, there was a business card. I snapped a photo because I thought I was losing it, and I believed that card wouldn't stick around if I blinked. When I picked it up, it felt warm, like it was baking in the humidity. My skin crawled, and I dropped it. It landed face up in the bowl. I heard a roar outside, and managed to get there just in time to see a matte black Javel SS whip around the corner. I dialed 911. They sent a cop, and he got all my info. An amber alert went out. Then came the waiting. I felt desperate, so I checked slash or slash booth world, but the subreddit was private. A few hours later, I got a call. The number was from a 917 area code. Hello, I said. I already knew who'd be on the other end. Ma'am, this is Samantha from Booth World Industries again. Your courtesy call is starting now. I hung up. My cell started ringing again. 323 area code. I yanked the battery out of my cell. My landline started ringing. Caller ID showed an 832 area code. 
I didn't pick up. I unplugged the foam and sat there with my face in my hands. I couldn't even begin to comprehend what was happening. I just sat there and cried, feeling completely powerless. That's when the phone started ringing. My cell buzzed across the table, away from its battery, and my unplugged home phone rang louder than it ever had before. I got in my car and left. I went to Walmart and used a payphone to call the detective in charge of Ariana's case. His name was Stark. After what felt like an eternity on hold, Stark answered. Mrs. Jacobs, he said. Have you found her? I asked. No, but we traced the number. It was some kid's cell phone from a block over from your place. He swears he never made the call, but the carrier says otherwise. The kid said he dialed a number for, hold on a sec. Here it is, Ruth World Industries, on a site called Reddit. Reddit, I corrected. That's what I said. There's no record of Booth World Industries anywhere. We're holding the kid, and I'll keep you posted if anything develops, all right. Is that all? I asked. All I want is my daughter back. Yes, ma'am. It's best to let us handle this, all right? Okay. Good, Stark said. We at the police department appreciate it, and feel free to call if you need to, but I'm sure we'll be in touch soon. You have a great day. I hung up, and the phone started ringing instantly. I picked it up, foolishly hoping it was Stark with an update. It wasn't. A male voice growled into my ear. The scheduled work has been completed. We at Booth World Industries appreciate it and welcome you to the club. Slasher Slash Booth World is now open. Have a great day. The call ended, and I hung up the phone. I brought my hand up to my ear. It was warm with his breath. E-D-I-T. I made a mistake. Everything's fine. We at the Jacobs household appreciate it. Have a great day. All right, we all recall those cardboard fortresses from our youth, the ones that outshone any Fisher-Price playhouse, because we painstakingly cut them out, pieced them together with tape, and adorned them with our own hands. Unlike the fancy plastic cottages your folks splurged on, these could be endlessly modified and expanded with a dash of creativity on your part and a few cardboard boxes your neighbors were about to toss. If you were the fortunate kid to score a refrigerator box, your coolness was sealed, at least for a few weeks. Feeling nostalgic yet? Great. You're in the same mental zone I was before my cherished childhood memories of cardboard and duct tape took a dark turn. Now my story. Three years ago, my folks decided it was time to move. My sisters and I took this with a grain of salt because my folks are known for their disorganization and none of their plans ever materialize without significant delays. But as it turned out, they soon commenced the renovations the house needed for selling. I was employed at a fairly popular clothing store at the time and we routinely received 15 to 30 boxes of merchandise every weekday. These were sizable boxes that once emptied would inevitably end up in the trash. I brought some of them home and began stockpiling them in the basement, thinking they might come in handy if my folks were indeed serious about this move. One evening, after my sister gave me a lift home from work, we were lugging a few flattened boxes down to the basement, and I began reminiscing about the incredible box tunnel my cousins had created when we were kids. It stretched all through their basement with plenty of nooks and crannies, and we were allowed to paint it however we pleased. Naturally, we were occupied for months playing in that thing. With these memories in mind, I glanced at our growing pile of boxes, then at my sister, and vocalized an idea that I'm sure we were both pondering. Casey, I said, we could build an amazing box fort with these. Before you start questioning the mental capacity of my sisters and me, given that we could entertain ourselves with a box fort, 
Let me clarify that it began mostly as a joke, that wouldn't it be hilariously absurd if we did this? Sort of thing. But yeah, we got really into it. We're a pretty creative family, so the construction was what we enjoyed. We didn't spend hours inside playing house or anything like that. We assembled it upstairs, the first eight boxes serving as a tunnel connecting my sister's rooms, Taylor and Casey, with a small entrance to the bathroom and another tunnel branching off to my room. We grabbed Sharpies and adorned it to our heart's content, hung up amusing pictures inside, and Casey even strung some Christmas lights, which added a nice touch. Any four-year-old would be proud to call this box for it their own. I brought home more boxes. We extended the tunnels, making them fancier and adding curves at the end, so when you were inside, you couldn't see an entrance unless you crawled all the way to the end. We even covered the whole thing with blankets to make it look better and to block out the light from the numerous gaps and openings throughout. Our dog, Juliet, was hesitant at first, but joined the Box Fort Club as soon as the three of us crawled inside to read ghost stories because she didn't want to miss out. It was really dark in there. We usually brought flashlights, and nearly every time we crawled through, we burst into fits of laughter, mainly because we were three fully grown girls crawling through a box fort. I mentioned this just to emphasize that, despite the complete darkness and the cramped size, there was none of that overwhelming atmosphere of fear, foreboding, and malevolence that often accompanies eerie places. At that point, it was still entirely ordinary and amusing, though it would have been a challenge to convince one of us to crawl through it to get to the bathroom at night, when the house was silent and everyone else was asleep. My folks understandably found the colossal obstruction in their hallway annoying, which they had to hop over to access their bedroom, the linen closet, and our bathroom. Still, they generally tolerated our antics and only threatened to dismantle it once or twice. Nevertheless, we decided we weren't satisfied with our box fort because we wanted to create an epic box fort. However, having already taken up the space in our bedrooms, the only remaining option was extending it across the hall to my parents' bedroom, something they'd never consent to while living in the house. Fortunately, they were going away for a week. That's when we filled every inch of free floor space in their bedroom and closet with box fort, and that's when the strange occurrences began. It happened progressively. We'd be in there, hanging up funny pictures or whatever, and then we'd hear a shuffling noise echoing down one of the numerous branching tunnels. Our assumption was that it was Juliet trying to locate us, but after calling her and searching, we'd discover she'd been lounging in a sunny spot on the couch for who knows how long. One time, Casey and I were inside hanging up paper bats we cut out, and we heard the shuffling from a distance. Juliet, Juwu Lee Etta, I hollered. It's not. What are you talking about? I said, baffled because her expression suddenly turned frightened. It's not Julie. Taylor just took her for a walk. They're both gone. I stared at her for a moment, recalling Taylor shouting something about walking the dog not too long ago, and then we both scrambled toward the nearest exit. Once we were outside the fort, we immediately burst into fits of giggles, feeling absurd now that we were safe. Do you think it's mice or something? Casey asked, wrinkling her nose. I replied that I didn't think so. The store was pretty clean, and the house had never had mice. But there had to be another explanation. The noise came from the section that extended into my parents' closet, a big walk-in with a window overlooking the backyard. The windows open in here. I bet it was just the breeze rustling the boxes. It was a perfectly logical explanation, one we were content to accept. That night, as I lay in bed, my gaze kept returning to the entrance of the fort. It was pitch dark in there, and something about having that wide black tunnel in my room made me feel extremely exposed. Eventually, I turned over and slept the other way, 
but I made a mental note to cover it up with a sheet the next day. On the second day without our parents, I used the grocery money to buy ingredients for a cookie-decorating extravaganza. Casey and I were in the kitchen baking cookies while a movie played in the background, making it quite noisy. We didn't hear Taylor until she stood in the doorway, shouting at us. If I remember correctly, the conversation went something like this. What the heck? Casey, what do you want? Casey and I exchanged puzzled glances, and Taylor regarded us as if we were daft. Are you kidding? I came all the way down here, and you don't even want anything. Tay, we didn't call you. Casey did. I was on the laptop in my room, and she told me to join her in the Voxfort. No, I didn't. I've been here baking cookies with Muse the whole time. Oh, come on, Casey. You totally did. I heard you. And then when I went in, you left and came down here. At this point, with one sister irate and the other bewildered, I intervened and got the full story from Taylor. Apparently, she was in her room when she heard Casey calling her name from inside the box fort. She asked what Casey wanted, and Casey insisted that she come into the box fort. Annoyed, Taylor finally complied. However, she couldn't see Casey inside, and a moment later, she heard Casey laughing with me down in the kitchen where Casey had always been. Needless to say, the atmosphere in the room shifted from warm and comfortable to incredibly eerie. I felt the need to step up as the big sister to reassure them. We argued for a while with the you're lying routine, but once both sides were convinced that the other was telling the truth, it was time for some investigating. Armed with a kitchen knife more for courage than any real fear for my life, I volunteered to inspect the box fort while they waited outside, keeping a close watch on me. I'm a rational, level-headed person. When it comes to the supernatural and the paranormal, I maintain a healthy dose of skepticism. I'm open to the idea of anything, ghosts, vampires, mermaids, you name it, but I won't buy into it until I see concrete scientific proof of its existence. At that time in my mind, such evidence hadn't materialized yet. That's why I had no qualms about investigating the fort after that incident. If it happened to be an intruder, well, what could they possibly do to me in a cramped little box fort with my sisters right there? Besides, someone had to take charge of the situation. With these thoughts in mind, I ventured into the fort and discovered nothing. No supernatural entities, no vagabonds, and no one else in the house. Somehow, I managed to persuade Taylor that the loud TV downstairs combined with Casey's and my voices had created the illusion. We all settled down to enjoy cookies and watch movies together, feeling reassured. Perhaps it was a residual effect of the daytime incident, but both Casey and Taylor had trouble sleeping that night. In fact, I woke up in the middle of the night to Casey's anxious voice calling out, Muse, muse. Parents with young children might become accustomed to this, but when I woke up to that, fear instantly gripped me. I leaped out of bed, grabbed my knife, and rushed to her room. To those of you who might be puzzled by the fact that I keep a knife in my bedside table drawer, remember that I'm a petted woman with little chance of defending myself against an intruder without some form of protection. Anyway, Casey's room was in darkness, and when I switched on the light, I found her sitting up in bed with wide-open eyes, looking on the verge of tears. Seeing nothing unusual, I demanded to know what was wrong. By then, Taylor had entered the room with Juliet in her arms. Casey explained that she had been sleeping when suddenly she awoke with the sensation that someone was in the room, watching her. She found herself staring at the entrance to the box fort. This sent a chill down my spine, as I had experienced something similar, but what she said next was even more peculiar. She kept her gaze fixed on the entrance, trying to quell her unease, when suddenly the boxes began to shake as if something inside them was moving rapidly away from her room. 
Apparently, that's when she started calling my name, waking up Taylor in the process. For the second time that day, I conducted a thorough search of the box fort and the entire house, but found nothing. I might have dismissed it as a dream if not for another strange incident the following day. Casey woke up an hour late for work because her alarm didn't go off. Her alarm had failed because her cell phone was missing, a phone she claimed to have placed beside her pillow before falling asleep. Taylor and I made an effort to help her find it before she left, scouring her bed and the floor, and even calling it from the home phone. However, none of us were particularly surprised or alarmed because Casey had a reputation for misplacing things. When Casey returned home that evening, I inquired whether her phone had been there when she woke us up in the middle of the night, but she couldn't recall seeing it. Nevertheless, she had been texting her friend in bed and had taken care to set the alarm and place it beside her. In the end, we decided to wait for it to turn up. Around three in the morning, I was once again roused from my sleep, this time by some disturbance outside my room. Again, I grabbed my knife and was startled by the noise, but what I primarily felt was anger and irritation. I had had enough of all the drama and wanted to put an end to it. Juliet was in my parents' closet, barking loudly at the box fort. Casey and Taylor were already awake, as bewildered as me about what was happening. Taylor picked up the dog and carried her out of the room, and Juliet immediately fell silent. This left Casey and me standing in the closet, wearing bewildered expressions. It was quiet for a moment, and then suddenly, Katy Perry's hot and cold song blared out loudly and clearly, causing both of us to jump. What the heck? I exclaimed, still trying to wrap my half-asleep head around this. Normally, my sisters tease me when I swear, claiming that I don't do it properly, but this time, they seemed to think it was appropriate. That's my ringtone, Casey said, giving me a strange look but not making any move to retrieve her phone. Well, answer it. I urged, feeling exasperated. Casey lifted the blanket covering the entrance of the box fort, and there was her missing cell phone, lying in the middle of the first box, still playing the song from its inadequate speaker. She opened it and held it to her ear. Hello? I waited for a moment and then asked, So, who is it? Casey expressed her disgust and abruptly ended the call. It's nothing, probably just our voices echoing in the background. They must have hung up, she explained while crossing her arms. She then turned her suspicion toward me. Why on earth would I steal your phone and wake all of us up at three in the morning? I responded incredulously. Casey shifted her focus to Taylor. I didn't touch your phone, Taylor exclaimed, a hint of fear in her expression. Are you both messing with me? This isn't funny, Casey said, growing agitated. You're really freaking me out. At this point, I could see the situation transitioning from strange to downright unsettling. I sighed and volunteered to once again search the entire house, emphasizing that Juliet might have taken the phone as a chew toy and left it in the box fort. It was the best explanation I could come up with at the time, although it didn't seem very plausible. After all, Juliet was missing most of her teeth, and the only things I had ever seen her play with were soft plush toys, slippers, and regrettably, dirty underwear. I know, cross. The idea of her having a cell phone in her mouth was hard to believe. Upon inspecting the house, I ensured that all the doors and windows were locked. Everything appeared to be secure, and we were safe. It seemed like one of those weeks where numerous minor incidents were adding up to a major headache. Before retiring for the night, I asked Casey if her phone displayed the caller ID for that particular call. No, it just showed unknown. I can't figure out why we didn't hear it, though. It was so loud. I don't know, I replied with a shrug, and maybe you should change your ringtone. It was too late to delve into the matter further. The following day appeared to be uneventful. 
The three of us spent time at the beach near our house, leaving us in high spirits, joking about how we overreact to the slightest odd occurrences. Casey had plans to attend a party that night, so it was just Taylor and me at home. I sensed that Taylor was still feeling uneasy about the box fort, so I decided to make it enjoyable again. I didn't want another late-night wake-up call. I gathered a stack of old magazines, some scissors, and glue, suggesting that we create a college on one of the interior walls. We played some upbeat music and chatted about an upcoming family trip when Taylor suddenly lowered the volume as if listening intently. What's up? I inquired. Did you put Juliet outside? She asked, her expression one of confusion. No, she's probably downstairs. Why? I didn't let her out either, but I can hear her barking. Well, maybe Casey did before she left, I said cheerfully. Let's go check. For the record, I couldn't hear anything, but Taylor had always been more attuned to Juliet than I was. When we searched the backyard, Juliet was nowhere to be found, and there was no barking to be heard. I could sense that Taylor was growing anxious. She had a deep affection for that dog. Meanwhile, I was becoming increasingly frustrated. Juliet didn't respond when we called her, so we had no choice but to search the house once again. We checked all her usual hiding spots, but there was no sign of her until we reached the upstairs area, hopping over the box fort to inspect closets and bedrooms. Suddenly, Taylor stood upright and told me to share. I hear her again, she whispered, prompting me to listen carefully. I don't hear anything, I said after a few moments. Can't you hear her barking? It sounds like she's far away. Are you sure it's not another dog? We didn't let her out. No, it's definitely her, Taylor insisted, moving toward my parents' closet to listen at the window. Come here, it's louder in here. She must be outside. When I reiterated that I couldn't hear anything, she rolled her eyes and retorted, You must be deaf, before heading downstairs to grab her shoes. We scoured the night for our dog, a four-hour quest, both on foot and in a car. Later, we brought Casey in for assistance. My heart remained in my throat throughout the entire ordeal, dreading the possibility of discovering something dreadful on the roadside and wondering how I could console two girls who adored Juliet as if she were their child, especially since nothing terrible had ever occurred in their lives before. There was also an unsettling unease related to that distant dog barking, but I set that aside for the time being. The following day was filled with anxious efforts, creating posters and displaying them while canvassing the neighborhood. My poor sisters were on the verge of tears, and I couldn't help but wonder why this had to happen while our parents were away. By nightfall, they had settled down to watch a movie with only half-hearted interest, waiting for a call. I, on the other hand, retired upstairs to quietly call my mom and ask her to come home earlier. I didn't know what would become of our dog, but I knew I needed some assistance in comforting my sisters. When I eventually retired to bed, the house was serene. My sisters had secured the house, extinguished the lights, and were asleep. I grew bored with my book, unable to sleep, and much like a few nights prior, I found it impossible to divert my gaze from the entrance to the box fort. I had covered it with a blanket as I had planned earlier, and while that seemed to provide some comfort, I still felt uneasy. At some point, I scolded myself silently, thinking, This is foolish. I'm going to sleep. I prepared to roll over to the other side when something caught the corner of my eye. The blanket covering the entrance moved slightly, as if stirred by a passing breeze. This was strange because all the windows had been closed when we switched on the air conditioning the previous day. I watched intently now, trying to determine in the dim light if the blanket was actually moving, as if someone were breathing beneath it, or if it was merely my imagination. It wasn't a figment of my imagination. As I watched, something inside touched the blanket with a single slender finger 
and traced a vertical path down to the bottom. I'm not particularly courageous, but something changes when you're responsible for the safety of others. Suddenly, frightening things don't paralyze you with fear, because you know you have to be brave for the people you care about. In this moment, my brain could only process the most logical explanation. I turned on the light, got out of bed quietly, and softly called out, Juliet. Receiving no response, I prepared to step forward when the boxes suddenly trembled as if something were moving through them. I admit I jumped, and my heart began racing. But I also remembered that we hadn't actually checked inside the box fort amidst all the commotion. Picking up the flashlight that lay on the floor near the entrance, I knelt down and lifted the cover, shining my light inside. The tunnel leading from my bedroom was empty. However, I couldn't see around the corners. Juliet, I called, keeping my voice down so as not to wake my sisters. I repeated, Juliet, using that stern, commanding tone. Finally, I heard a faint whimper, reminiscent of her puppy days, and a shuffling noise moving further away from me. I cursed under my breath. Beyond all the associations of a creepy box fort in the middle of the night, all I could think about was my little dog, possibly hurt and frightened. I wanted to reach her before my sisters did, to assess the damage, if any. Things could quickly spiral out of control with them if Juliet was in bad shape. So, heroism triumphing over cowardice, I got on my hands and knees with the flashlight and entered. Inside, it was eerily silent, the type of silence that makes you feel as if your ears are stuffed with cotton, but you can hear your own breath clearly. As I advanced through the tunnel, I first looked right, toward my sister's rooms, but saw nothing. Then I looked left, and I heard shuffling, catching the tail end of something black as it turned a corner. Juliet. Juliet. I whispered, trying to keep my voice gentle and inviting, but that dog never came when called. I sighed and pressed on, passing by our failed college attempt along the way. When I reached the end, I turned my flashlight down the long tunnel leading to the closet. Unfortunately, my feeble light couldn't reach the far end. It simply stopped at a wall of darkness. At this point, my determination wavered. I must have remained on my hands and knees for a full minute before hearing the whimpering again and something shuffling farther down the tunnel. It urged me forward. Resolutely, I continued toward the closet fully expecting my weak flashlight beam to eventually reveal the red fleece blanket with penguins on it, which we had used to cover the entrance to the closet within the fort. However, I found nothing. Not even an opening. The best way I can describe it is by likening it to a childhood game we played where you lay on the floor, close your eyes, and raise your arms and legs, with friends lowering them to the ground slowly. Initially, it feels normal, but at some point, your brain anticipates your body hitting the floor, and when it doesn't, when you keep descending, it feels as if you are possibly passing through the floor. That's what being in that tunnel felt like. I kept crawling, shining my small flashlight ahead, gradually growing more and more disconcerted as I reached no end and saw no signs of one. Another nagging thought gnawed at me how the boxes had shaken when something inside had moved away from me. Juliet is a small dog, a miniature schnauzer. When she traversed the tunnels, she didn't need to duck. All you could hear was the soft padding of her feet and the slight scratching of her nails against the cardboard. The boxes only shook and shifted when something large moved through them, like me. I don't know how far I traveled or how long I was in there, but at some point, I stopped with a clear sense that this isn't right. I visualized the fort in my mind. Based on my calculations, I should have been somewhere in the backyard by then, suspended two stories high. It had finally dawned on me that I was currently in a space that couldn't possibly exist, pursuing something larger than Juliet and still within. Panic overtook me, and I hastily retreated. 
Crawling in the opposite direction didn't appear to lead anywhere except into a never-ending tunnel. I was completely unhinged, tearing apart the boxes at their seams, punching my way through, and finally finding myself in a jumbled mess of blankets and cardboard in the middle of my parents' closet. I must have appeared quite ridiculous, sprawled on the floor like that, but when I gazed at the tight walls of that five-foot by ten-foot walk-in closet, goosebumps erupted on my back and arms. It was akin to going outside for a run, then turning around after ten minutes of jogging, only to realize you hadn't even left your front porch. It just didn't make sense. I had crawled so far into that tunnel, but I hadn't gone anywhere. I had followed something that was still inside, something that couldn't possibly exist. To this day, I can't explain it, and I prefer not to dwell on it. Even worse, I don't like to remember that persistent whimpering that followed me all the way back. Trembling with lingering fear, right then and there, I began disassembling the box fort. When my sisters stumbled out of their rooms, groggy and bewildered, I muttered something about needing to take it down before Mom returned and continued my task. I left just one box standing. I figured, if I was losing my mind, I might as well go all the way. Thinking of our dog, I left a solitary box standing alone in the closet and transported all the others to our backyard's fire pit. The following morning, I incinerated them, and my mom was back home by the afternoon. That's not quite the conclusion of the tale, as there was some happiness awaiting us later, but I almost wish it were the end. What followed didn't provide much closure for me. We eventually located Juliet a few days later. She was all right, a tad skittish and jumpy initially, but elated to see us. My family was overjoyed, and nothing could really dampen their spirits, not even the little matter of where I had found her. It appeared that for everyone except me, all thoughts of the box fort had been completely erased. On the day she returned home, I was alone in the house, washing dishes after a pancake breakfast and allowing my mind to wander. Suddenly, I became aware of a muffled scratching and whimpering sound coming from nearby. My heart soared, and I checked the back door, the garage door, and the front door, all to no avail, before realizing the noise was coming from above me. Slowly, I ascended the stairs, tracing the sound to my parents' room, and finally to their closed closet door. I opened it, and my little dog leaped out, barking and wagging her tail with excitement. After that, I got rid of the last box, though it might have been too late. That night, my mom entered my room, carrying a bundle of socks and underwear, and inquiring about their ownership. She still handled our laundry from time to time, and couldn't always tell whose was whose. I selected my items, and as she was leaving, she turned around with a grin, chuckling and shaking her head. Whose Halloween costume is hanging in my closet? It startled me half to death. I put down my book. What costume? You know, the tall black one with the long arms and white eyes. It looks incredibly lifelike. Is it from a movie or something? For a brief moment, I only stared blankly at her. Oh, um, yeah, it's mine. I'll move it downstairs. I waited until I heard my mom's footsteps descending the stairs, then I quietly made my way to her room. Fear had an almost hypnotic grip on me, compelling me toward the closet. All I knew was that I had to see. The closet door was open, but the light was off. Holding my breath, I flicked it on and surveyed the scene. Clothes, boxes, belts, ties, suitcases, blankets, everything arranged neatly. And then at the back, a narrow space about half a foot wide where the clothes had been shifted aside. A lone plastic hanger swayed back and forth, gradually slowing down. The window beside me stood open. 